You're listening to a message presented at Newmarket Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in Newmarket, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at Newmarket Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. And I titled this morning's message, Harmful Assumptions. And before we get started, I'd like for us to take just a moment to go to God in prayer. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, uh, we live in a world where, where harmful assumptions seems to be a, a constant challenge for folks. And we found out from Scripture, it's not something new. Dear Lord, as we open up your word today, and as we strive to understand what can happen in life, as we strive to understand your hand and your watch care in our lives, Lord, we ask for your blessings. I ask that your spirit will work through me, and that your message will come forward in a bold and effective way, in order that it might make a difference in the lives of your, of your family, dear Lord. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Harmful assumptions. Have you ever heard the old saying, music calms the savage beast? You ever heard that? I've heard that throughout the years. Music calms the savage beast. Now I read a story this week about a musician who put this assumption to the test. Now here's what, here's what happened. This, this, uh, this person, it was a female, she was a violinist. Now there is some really pretty violin music. Those violinists can make beautiful hypnotic music. Well, she was playing her violin and she began to notice that it had an effect on her audience. Her audience would sit there just literally for hours, mesmerized, almost motionless. It's like they were in a trance. And say, listen to her play on her violin. She found that not only did her music have an effect on her friends when she played, but when she would go to their house and play her violin, she began to notice that even their pets would come and stand and gaze at her as she played that beautiful violin music. The dogs and cats... They were just spellbound. And she began to wonder to herself. She thought, now, if the people sat mesmerized like this, and if the domestic animals sat spellbound like these cats and dogs are, I wonder. I wonder if wild animals would do the same thing. That's what she started to wonder. And she assumed that they probably would because people did and the pets did. So she, she assumed that the wild animals would probably do the same thing. So she decided to head off to Africa and give it a try. She got on an airplane. She flew over to Africa. And when she got there, she went out into a clearing in the middle of the jungle. And she found herself a spot, picked up her violin, and she began to play beautiful violin music. And to her amazement, it began to work. A lion trotted out of the jungle and sat down there with his paws in front of her, just looking over at her as she played that beautiful violin music. And, and, and out trotted an elephant. And the elephant just stood there in amazement with its ears raising and lowering as it listened to that beautiful violin music. A gorilla charged out and the same thing happened. Just sat there. Just sat there listening in the clearing to that beautiful violin music. Everything was going really, really well. Her assumptions were proving to be absolutely true. When all at once, 
She heard an awful rustling in the jungle. And out ran a lion, pounced on her, and killed her instantly. That one lion that had been sitting there for so long listening to that beautiful music looked over at that other lion and he said, Why in the world did you do that? That was beautiful music. And the other lion cupped his paw over his ear and said, Huh? Well, just now get it. <laughs> You know, um, we assume that everybody's going to hear things in exactly the same way. We assume that everyone's going to respond in exactly the same way to the things that we say. I mean, we've thought it through. We know what we're trying to get across. But it just doesn't always work that way. Not everyone hears the same thing. You see, not all assumptions are going to be true. We've got to be careful to make sure we get all the facts when we're trying to understand what's going on around us. In fact, whatever is dealing with some assumptions and things that are going on there, it even happens in the court. Do you know that? It's, it can even happen in the court system. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17 puts it this way. It says, in a lawsuit, the first to speak seems right until someone comes forward and cross-examines. Hmm. And that's so true. Yeah, they made their case really well until someone pokes holes in it by asking a few questions. Truth, my friends, can at times be very, very elusive. It's just a fact of life. And I don't know if you realize this or not, but there's a lot of people in this, this whole world of ours that are just plain deceptive. And I think a lot of them might wear political titles. They'll say whatever they think they've got to say to get into office and do whatever they want to do after they get there. You know, people can just plain be deceptive. Unfortunately, over the years I've learned that people will cheat, lie, steal, and even kill in order to get what they want. We live in a world that's messed up. And sometimes we think it just must be our world today. Surely it's just been getting worse and worse and worse. Surely it's not always been this way. But I have a feeling if you really did dig deep into the matter, you'd find that these kind of things have been going on for a long, long time. In fact, in the story of chapter 30, Paul describes the same kind of thing happening when he was walking on the face of the earth. And that's been a while ago. Over 2,000 years ago. Paul had to continually, continually combat false assumptions as he ministered for Jesus Christ. If you've been reading along in the story, you will recall what the prophet Agabus did from your reading this week. He came to Paul and he took he took his belt and he tied up his own hands and his own feet. And then he predicted that Paul would be bound by the Jewish leaders and handed over to the Gentiles, the Romans, if you will, be handed over to them. Now, whenever the people began to hear this, when they saw what the prophet was doing and what the, they heard what the prophet was saying, they couldn't state strongly enough how much they wanted Paul just to stay where he was, to stay away from Jerusalem, to, to not go to that place where these folks were waiting to tie him up and hand him over. They wanted him to avoid contact with those folks who would give him over to the Romans. But Paul's response was very apostolic. He refused to flinch. It's like there is no way I'm going to hide from those people. I'm not going to do it. Let's take a moment to examine Acts chapter 21, verses 10 to 14, and just let the scriptures speak for themselves. It says there, after we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and his feet with it, and he said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, 
the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When he heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. And then Paul answered, Why in the world are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we started on our way up to They're going to head right on off to Jerusalem with them. You see, Paul wasn't going to let the threats of this Jewish bunch of power mongers keep him from doing the work of God. He was going to march right into Jerusalem in spite of Agabus' warning. He headed straight to the city of Jerusalem. And whenever he got to Jerusalem, what he discovered is that some of the folks who had tried to kill him before on his first missionary journey, some of those folks were waiting there in Jerusalem for him. And they wanted nothing, nothing less than to make life extremely difficult for Paul. In fact, they were going to do their best to stir problems up for him in the city of Jerusalem. Paul simply ignored them, and he headed straight toward the temple. Hmm. Now, these legalistic bunch of troublemakers, they thought they had him for sure. Because when he came marching through town, along there beside him, walking right along beside him, was an Ephesian by the name of Trophimus. Trophimus, the Ephesian, was walking through town with Paul, so they made some assumptions. The first assumption we find in the story, chapter 30, is this. These rabble-rousers assumed that Paul had taken Trophimus, who they had seen walking with him. They assumed that he had taken Trophimus into the temple with him. What an assumption. They didn't know, they just assumed. So they went around telling everyone. They said, Paul, that Paul dude, he's defying the temple. He took a Greek man inside the temple with him. They didn't see it for themselves. They just saw him walking through town. They just assumed that he did. But they were telling everybody. They were saying he took him in. Sure enough, he took that vision right in the temple with him. And then they told folks that Paul was preaching and teaching against the law and against the Jewish nation and against the temple of Jehovah. And they were just making stuff up. And they were making all kinds of stuff up because none of this, none of this was true. Paul had not taken Trophimus into the temple. Paul was not teaching or preaching against the Jews. He, he was literally praying, fervently praying that the Jews might come to the reality of grace and understand the reality of grace as he had come to understand it. He was boldly, boldly sharing the truths of God with anyone who would listen. That's what Paul was doing. But these folks made up lies. You see, he wanted them to understand the law was important. It was the tutor that pointed people toward the truths of God. The law wanted people to understand everyone was a sinner in need of God's grace. Did you know that that's what the law did? It pointed out the sinfulness of man? It made it clear that we could not live up to God's righteous expectations and that we needed a Savior. Paul, he said, the law was a tutor. It was leading you to the point that you would be ready to accept the gift of God shared on Calvary through the blood of Jesus when he purchased grace once for all. He said, the old way of the written code, the old way of the law, it was a tutor to prepare you for grace. He said, it's all a process. Someone is coming. Someone has come. Someone is Coming again. You have been listening over the course of this year. Someone is coming again. It's God's plan from beginning to end. The law, you see, was the light that highlighted the fact that mankind needed a Savior. Paul wasn't trying to denigrate that, to overshadow that. Paul was saying the law has a very important role to play. It leads people to the grace purchased on Calvary. He didn't want to tear down the law. Paul wanted to point out the law's role in leading mankind to the foot of the cross. 
But these malcontents, these Jewish leaders, these malcontents refused to listen. All they saw was their way of life being swept away by this message of love and grace. I mean, if God's going to extend his love and he's going to extend his grace, if sacrifices are no longer necessary, if temple taxes are no longer a part of it, we're going to lose our livelihood. You see, they weren't concerned about the truth. They wanted to keep their income, their prestige, and their power. That was their concern. And to do this, to keep these things from being taken away, they need to get rid of Paul because he's messing stuff up. They wanted to get rid of him. And what they did is they stirred the people up against Paul. They seized him. And they started to beat him, hoping that they'd literally beat him to death. Now, I really believe that. They would have liked to have seen this violent mob beat Paul to death. But as they were beating Paul to a pulp, the commander got word of a riot taking place in Jerusalem. And he came with his soldiers, and, and he put a stop to the violence. He wouldn't let them beat him any longer. But it was so bad that they had to literally drag Paul out of the crowd and take him down to the barracks just in order to get him out of there safely. This violent mob was trying to kill this man. There was such a ruckus, the commander, the commander was trying to figure out what was going on, and he was confused by it all. But when he took him back to the barracks, something weird happened. You see, now you have to understand the background. Let me explain what happened just a short while before. Just a short while before this, there's this Egyptian dude. He got a whole bunch of folks. I think he said it's around 4,000 of them. And he led them off into the wilderness in a revolt. Now, he was revolting against Rome. And what this, this uh, centurion thought is that, now this is probably that, that Egyptian causing trouble again. That, that's what he thought. Probably that Egyptian causing trouble again. So he took him back, assuming that he was taking this Egyptian prisoner back with him to the barracks. But whenever they were getting close to the barracks, he began to celebrate a little too soon. Can you just imagine now? You have to try and put yourself back in the place of put yourself back in the place of the centurion. Here is this centurion, and he thinks he's just captured a villain. Now I can just imagine the thought process that's going on in his mind. Caesar, when he hears about this, when he calls, and when he hears that I caught that Egyptian that Egyptian ruckus rouser, he's going to be so proud of me. I mean, he may want to give me an award. Maybe he'll even bring me back to, to Rome in order that I can be there and, and protect him and be a part of his special forces. Can't you just imagine the thought process going on in his mind? Wow, he, he was thinking, man, this is good for me. I thought I was going to get in trouble for a riot taking place, and here I am having caught this Egyptian that everyone was looking for. I'm probably going to get a commendation. And then all at once in the middle of all this, his daydream was jerked to a halt. Because this man that he thought was an Egyptian, that he was having carried back to his barracks, started talking to him in the Greek language. The language of the Romans. Now he's confused. Now, now, wait a minute, dude. You speak Greek? I thought you were that Egyptian terrorist. <laughs> I can just imagine Paul getting a little smile on his face. Nope, 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 I'm not. He said, I am a Jew from Tarsus, Cilicia. Can't you just imagine the change in the demeanor that the captain would have had? He thought he had caught a villain and all they got was a Jew that all the other Jews were mad at. Finally, Paul said, now, you think it'd be okay if I, if I talked to this crowd of people? Well, gave him permission. And lo and behold, if he didn't show off even more language skill. Because he looked out at this group of people and he decided to speak to them in Aramaic. Good grief, I'm doing good just to speak English. And I think sometimes I got hillbilly English. Paul used this occasion 
to preach to the Jews and to the Roman soldiers. He told them about his past. He told them about his miraculous call on the road to Damascus. He went on to tell them about the vision that God had given to him. How that he was told he was going to be hated by the Jews because he was going to be a spokesman for the Gentiles. He laid it all out there and the Jews got really ticked. They didn't want anybody preaching the gospel, preaching a message from their God. They didn't want anybody speaking to these Gentile Roman people. After all, they were their captors, if you will. I mean, they were subservient to them. They began to cry out, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. Get rid of Paul. It's about here that we find another assumption in the story. Chapter 30. The commander assumes Paul must have done something really, really bad to tick off this many Jewish people. He must have done something awful. And he's not about to admit it so the commander decides he'll have it beat out of him. He had Paul bound and stretched out in preparation for a merciless flogging. He's going to use some drastic interrogation measures, if you will, to get this troublemaker to confess what he's done to take off all these Jews. It's about here that we see another assumption in the story, chapter 30. The commander assumes that he has a right to treat this Jew however he wants to. And he gives the order to beat that confession out of Paul. The centurion gets ready to have Paul flogged. And all at once, now I don't know what your political connection is, don't make too many connections, I don't get in trouble. Paul plays his trump card. Paul played his trump card. Snowden paraphrased. Paul says, hey dude, are you really going to flog a Roman citizen before he's even found guilty? Are you going to do that? Even the commander doesn't have a right to beat a Roman citizen without a proper trial. Can't you just picture? Here's all these people sitting there with the cat and nine tails. And all at once they're backing away. <laughs> you know, putting the cat and nine tails behind him, hiding it away. The commander begins to ask some questions because now he's confused. Let's read what he says there in Acts chapter 22, beginning with verse number 27. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. I, I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. Talk about a trump card. Man, he had one. Paul was a Roman citizen by birth. The commander's assumption was blown away. He didn't have a right to simply beat a confession out of Paul. Again and again, Paul was faced with false assumptions and thus fake accusations. The same thing happens today in churches around the world. Same thing. False assumptions run rapid. And you say, oh no, preacher, we'd never do that. Yeah, right. Someone sees a car park where they don't think it should be, and they assume someone's having an inappropriate rendezvous. I've got the phone calls from people before, church people, did you know so-and-so was parked down by so-and-so's house? They should really be there. I mean, I've... Someone sees someone in a bar and they just assume that they're getting drunk. And I happen to know they went to pick up their cousin that was drunk. In fact, I went to pick him up a few times. Someone sees someone leave the church and begin attending someone else's church in another location and they just assume that they're mad at the preacher. When in really it's because someone was sick over there and they wanted to spend some time with them before they died. You just make false assumptions all over the place. Someone sees a teenager at a questionable movie and they just assume that the parents gave them permission to be there. Duh, that's stupid. You must have never had teenagers yourself or been one. <laughs> oh, never mind. Someone hears a portion of a conversation and yet they assume they know everything talked about and they go off telling folks what they know, whether they know it or not. Someone sees a church member doing things that are unbiblical and they assume that the church they attend approves. False assumptions. 
False assumptions are still a big issue today. Lives are still being broken as a result of false assumptions. In the case of Paul, a man completely dedicated to God found himself to be susceptible to false assumptions and to false accusations. It really shouldn't surprise us that we have to deal with the same thing today. Paul wasn't out of step with God's will. Paul was directly in the middle of God's will. His, con- his accusers, if you will, they had a real mixed up idea about what a relationship with God was supposed to look like. They're trying to stop this newfangled message of grace from spreading. What God wanted was for them to open their eyes and to see this new way of grace was much, much better than the law would have ever been for them. That's what he wants them to understand. Paul is willing to suffer to get this message across. He wants people to hear about grace. He's willing to suffer to get that message across. But get this. Even Paul knew it was crazy to suffer if he didn't have to. Let me say that again. Even Paul knew it was crazy to suffer if he didn't have to. Thus he boldly played his citizenship, his trump card, if you will. In the same way, we must be willing to take a stand even when that stand isn't popular. And I'm about to take one. If you've been in my study on Wednesday mornings, you know where I stand on this issue already. If you have not, you're about to find out. One area where I think Christians are missing the boat today is in their assumptions about Islam. We have been told over and over again that the folks bombing and killing Christians and Jews around the world are just the extremist Muslims. Just the extremists, there's just a few of them. A few million of them. Just a few of them. It's time for us to cry out to the world, Islam is not a religion of peace. We've hidden our heads in the sand far, far too long. Islam itself stands in opposition to Christians and Jews. And if you wonder whether I'm telling the truth or not, I have two copies of the Quran back in my office that are clearly marked in the places I can just point to where you can read out of their book where it says to befriend Christians and Jews until you get the upper hand and then kill them. Put it like. The Quran makes it clear that any non-Muslim is an infidel who must be converted or lulled into a stupor until you can rid the earth of them. If that is a religion of peace, if that is what you want to invite in, then be my guest. But as for me, I want to make known where I stand. It's time for us to let the truth be known. Christians are being killed in the name of Allah around the world. Hiding our heads in the sand isn't going to fix the issue. We need to cry out, here and now, Islam is not a religion of peace. It's a religion of submission. In essence, it demands that everyone submits to their will. Everyone submits to Sharia law. Everyone becomes like they are, and if you are unwilling to become like they are, you don't deserve to live. Point blank. I'm just being as clear as I know how to be. Convert or die is their cry. It is time for us to get past this country club idea of religion and begin to realize that true religion and undefiled is caring for the widows and the orphans. Yes, we're supposed to love our neighbors. Yes, we're supposed to love our enemies. No doubt. Jesus is clear on that. Reaching out in love while being dedicated to the truth is what we need to understand we're talking about here. You can't throw the truth out in order to give warm fuzzy feelings to somebody. You have to call a duck a duck. If it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, swims like a duck, it's probably a duck, a duck. Assumptions can be extremely harmful. What we need is the truth. And Jesus made the truth known, and folks don't like it. In the book of John, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says clearly, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other name under heaven by which mankind must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Yes, Christianity says there's no way but Jesus. And yet, let me tell you this. Christianity is an inclusive religion. Hear that word? It's an inclusive religion. 
Everyone can be included, but no one is forced to be a believer. Christianity offers grace, love, and forgiveness to all, but it forces grace, love, and forgiveness on absolutely no one. We extend an invitation, not an ultimatum. We're not going to chop your head off if you don't agree with us. That invitation, that invitation to accept what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary once for all, that invitation to accept the grace paid for by the blood of Jesus, that invitation to be included in the family of God is about to be extended to you. If you want the grace paid for in full by Jesus, we ask you to come. Confess Him as your Lord and Savior today. I want you to know the baptistry is already ready. We'd be glad to baptize you into Christ so that you can be raised up to walk in newness of life with Him. We'd love you to join the family of God. It's an inclusive family. We want you to be a part. Without Jesus, my friends, there is no peace. To know Jesus is to know true peace. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Him? Do you have a personal relationship with Him? His grace is sufficient. You've not done anything that His grace cannot cover. That's how big His grace is. His grace flows down. And it's able to cover even the darkest of our sins. Won't you come and give your life to Him as we stand this morning and as we sing, His grace flows down. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.